Thank you, Ann, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you for being with us. I want to uh, especially recognize the subject matter experts that uh, are joining us today to help, uh, Ray Graves uh, from the SBA, who will be addressing um, capital issues and opportunities for small businesses to uh, access capital through the SBA um, in given these times. Um, and then uh, Zachary uh, Youssef, who is a senior uh, tax manager at Plant Moran, and he'll be helping us understand better uh, all of the uh, aspects of the legislation addressing uh, employees and, and uh, assistance, financial assistance to employees and how employers handle that. Uh, tax is an important part of this because most of this looks like it's going to happen through the IRS. And then finally, Kylie Smith, who uh, will, uh, who's vice president at Home Savings of Commercial Banking, and she'll give us the uh, one, her her uh, impressions about the SBA program as an SBA lender, uh, but also uh, some thoughts around commercial banking generally in uh, in this environment. Um, I did want to say that this is the uh, the first of a series of uh, calls like this that we want to have and um, to reach out and help our members and um, also to allow our members to communicate with one another. Um, tomorrow we'll be launching a, a Ron Clough, a member of our manufacturing technology group. Uh, we'll be la launching a blog on our website, our new website, by the way, please check it out if you haven't. Um, and Ron will be addressing sort of what we've heard so far about what companies are doing uh, to respond to the uh, challenges today. Uh, but it's also a, we wanted to sort of start a chat, you know, a, uh, a forum, so to speak, uh, for our members to share with one another things that they're working on so that we can all sort of work towards uh, best practices uh, in this environment. Um, so uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over uh, to our uh, first presenter, and uh, that's uh, Ray Graves. Thanks, Ray. Perfect. So this is Ray Graves from the uh, Cleveland District Office. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Can I get a, a amen if you can? We can hear you, Ray. Thank you. All right. Perfect. So what I'm going to be talking about today <clears throat> is the tool that we have available right now. So the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is something that's been available for years. It is uh, traditionally declared where there's been a physical disaster, right? So when there was flooding in the Northwest or when there was a tornado, you know, in the Dayton area, those particular areas would have been designated uh, disaster areas. Well, what we've done today and uh, in fact is available right now is designate the entire state as an economic injury disaster area. And that makes available for the entire state of Ohio uh, economic injury disaster loans. Let's go to the next slide. So um, what is an economic injury disaster loan? First of all, the, the most important thing to understand is that it is a working capital loan and it is designed to replace uh, or defray expenditures that a small business or not-for-profit would have been able to make but for this disaster. So if you're thinking is, hey, I had $2 million in sales last year, that's all gone, I want $2 million, that's not exactly the right way to be thinking about it. Rather, what we want you to be thinking about is, okay, for the time horizon that we're looking at, um, what is the minimum amount of money that you would need to cover your fixed expenses to keep the business viable during this period? And that's the figure that you're going to be kind of coming to um, through the application process. So who's available? Who actually can apply for this economic injury disaster loan? Small businesses, small agricultural cooperatives, small aquaculture businesses, and most private nonprofit organizations. So that is a departure from SBA's traditional mandate. You know, traditionally, if you're uh, if you're involved with SBA lending at all, you would know that not-for-profits aren't eligible for SBA loans in general. But in a disaster, it's a, a different uh, situation. Apply for these loans. Um, the exception there would be probably um, religious organizations and potentially some other ones but most of the uh, private not-for-profits are going to be able to apply. Um, you must be directly affected by the disaster and located in the disaster area. And that's important because we do get calls from folks who are looking to take advantage of the situation right now to uh, expand their businesses. And, you know, completely 
um, ethical way, right? So people who are, are making masks or they're, they've got medical devices and they need to ramp up for that. They haven't been negatively affected yet. So there is a, you know, still the full realm of SBA support products that are out there, loan guarantees, microloans, uh, debenture sales that can help a business expand if they still are in that space. Uh, next slide, please. So how much can you borrow? Well, the maximum loan under uh, idle, economic injury disaster loan, I'll be using the term idle, the maximum you can borrow under an idle loan is $2 million. Um, but again, the amount that you're going to get is going to depend on the fixed expenses that you have, the, the expenses that you have to, to keep the, the business viable for the time horizon that you're expecting. And if that goes to $2 million, that's great. But generally, it's going to be established at some amount less than that. The rate will be 3.75% for businesses and 2.75% for not-for-profits. Importantly, the first four months of an idle loan are deferred. So you won't be making payments for the first four months after the note date. You can use the funds for fixed debt payments. You could use it for payroll. You could use it for accounts payable and other bills as well. Um, you can't use it to buy new equipment. You can't use it for uh, fixed assets. It is a working capital loan. Uh, next slide. Let's go back a slide. Can you do that? <laughs> All right, thanks. Oh, there you go. So one thing to add on this slide again is the term of the loan. I don't know if I've got that in another slide coming up, but the term of the loan is going to be established between 15 and 30 years based on the ability to repay of the company or the not-for-profit that's applying for the loan. So the amount of the tenure is going to be established based on ability to repay. I'm not sure many will get the 30 years, but it's certainly possible. Um, what that means is that the, these payments are going to be extremely affordable for small businesses because we're going to be extending the payment out for so long. It's very unusual for a working capital loan to be extended out 15 to 30 years. Usually that's reserved for real estate, uh, but we're going to try and keep these affo as affordable as possible. Uh, next slide. Okay, the collateral requirements on an idle loan. Real estate is preferred on loans over $25,000. No collateral is required on loans under $25,000. So if you've got a small request in, you know, just for say utility payments for 12 months or something like that, um, that loan is, is sort of akin to a signature loan situation where there's gonna be a personal guarantee required. But if you're looking for more than 25,000 or your awards more than 25,000, SBA is gonna engage this concept of all available collateral, meaning if the business has collateral available, we'll go ahead and file a lien against it. But importantly, if you don't have collateral, that's not going to be a reason for decline. Uh, so again, there is some misinformation about that out there. I've seen some people say, hey, you know, if I don't have the collateral to get one of these, that's not going to be the case. Um, if you have ability to repay, um, we'll take the collateral that we can, obviously, this is to support the taxpayer, uh, but that's not going to be a reason for decline in and of itself. Uh, the government will take a lien on, you know, subordinate lien on assets. Next slide. So this slide says basic filing requirements. I guess I should probably term it basic application requirements um, because these are the sorts of things that you're going to be submitting when you go on to apply for one of these loans. You're going to have to have application information. Now, if you are doing a physical uh, uh, application, which is available but not preferred, you would be filling out this SBA Form 5 if you're a corporation or 5C if you're a sole proprietorship. So Form 5 uh, is just, you know, the, the uh, particulars of the information on the company, including the federal tax ID number and social security number of the owner and, um, you know, what exactly is happening. Your federal business income tax return will be required. So at least one year and possibly more of federal business income tax returns should be required. You'll be required to put in a schedule of liabilities, which is form 2202. And you'll be for, you'll be asked to submit a personal financial statement, which is SBA form 413D. Now all of the principals of the business and 20% greater owners will be required to submit that personal financial statement. I think I skipped over IRS 4506T. What that is, is an IRS transcript request. You're gonna fill out this transcript request uh, you'll submit it as part of your package to SBA, and we'll use that to verify that the tax returns you're giving to us are the same as the tax returns that were given to the IRS. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Other things that you might have to uh, add as well would include personal tax returns for the principals. 
year-end financial statements. For example, if you don't have your 2019 business tax return done, you should submit year-end financial statements, uh, hopefully compilations or audits or reviews, whatever you've got, uh, but needs to be something submitted uh, for year-end 2019. And um, if your fiscal year happens to be, um, for example, like a September 30th, you should expect that we will be requiring an interim uh, current profit and loss statement as well. So something current to within 90 days. For economic injury disaster loans, which is what we're talking about, SBA is usually going to require a form 1368 as well, which is a monthly sales form to show um, how the sales of the company have been doing in the last several months. Next slide. So some of the entities that are not uh, eligible for an idle loan include farms, religious organizations, gambling concerns, casinos, and racetracks. Real estate developers <clears throat> real estate developers are normally not eligible for an idle loan. However, landlords are in another departure from SBA's typical practice. If someone uh, owns a commercial property or an apartment building or something and can demonstrate uh, adverse effects from the COVID uh, crisis, they'll be able to apply uh, for one of these idle loans. Next slide. Okay, how do you apply? Uh, you're going to apply through disasterloan.sba.gov. There's other ways of getting to the same place. sba.gov slash disaster will get you there as well. But disasterloan.sba.gov is the uh, preferred email to use. You click on that, and there's uh, options to, to go through and, um, and submit your application online. Paper loan applications can be downloaded from sba.gov slash disaster. They can be completed. They can be mailed to the SBA at a Texas address there. Uh, on your slide, but we don't recommend it. And the reason why we don't is that if you submit it to us, it's gonna you know, potentially be sitting in a pile waiting for someone to just do what you could have done when go into the, into the system and enter the information. Uh, so rather than bog us down with that, uh, we recommend using the, uh, the website. SBA, SBA's customer service center is at 800-659-2955. Uh, that can provide applications as well. You can also email uh, disaster customer service at sba.gov, again, disaster customer service at sba.gov. Next slide. Okay, submitting an application, the biggest cause of delay is missing information. Um, I recognize that when you go in the system and you start entering things, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, a lot of blanks to fill in, uh, a lot of information to provide and upload. And um, I would just say, you know, do your very best, set aside the time to, to enter a full complete application right away. Take aside some time before going in to make sure you've got your P PFS there, that you've got your corporate tax returns ready, that you've got your uh, corporate um, uh, most recent compilation available, that you've got a debt schedule available to you, so that you've got that information and when you're keying things in, it's going to go quickly for you. Next slide. Okay, this is just kind of a silly screenshot. It's it's from disasterloan.sba.gov. You're going to want to click on the blue button. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, that uh, almost concludes, I think, what we've got. Is there one more slide, one or two? So this is just a registration screen, so you know what screen you're doing, uh, that you're, you're in the legitimate SBA screen. That's where you're registering. Go ahead, next. And a few of the, the registration information screens before you actually start an application. Go ahead and do next. And for Columbus District, if you are in uh, the, the central or southern part of the state, uh, you've got your direct lines there of some folks that can answer questions. And on the next slide, uh, the Cleveland District Office. And there's four of us here that are in the lender relations uh, segment. Um, I'm at 216-522-4192. Again, that's 216-522-4192. Or you can reach Raymond.Graves at SBA.gov. Again, Raymond.Graves at SBA.gov. But there's three other guys here as well that are also available to answer questions and, and help guide people. Um, further, uh, if you need other help and you can't reach us, your local small business development center can help. Uh, further, the local SCORE uh, office, which is the mentorship program, also can help. So there's lots of help out there if you're just confused about, you know, how do I fill out a personal financial statement or where do I get the forms or how do I get online or something like that. Um, there's lots of people out there that can, can help. But as of right now, my understanding is that that website um, disasterloan.sba.gov is is applicable for folks to go in and request a disaster loan at this moment. Uh, I didn't see anything come up through chat in terms of questions, but um, if anyone has a question, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask it now.
Okay, Ray, I just had one clarification. This, this, uh, for this program, the money's coming from the SBA as opposed to coming from a bank. Is that correct? That's correct. These are direct loans. Direct loans. Okay, very good. Okay, and thank you. There's, there's a question that came up. Is it practical to think that funding up to 25,000 will be available within five days, even with the potential for a surge of applicants? You know, we are hearing that Indiana, which opened up a little bit before us, has been able to get folks money within five days. But I think a realistic time frame is 30 days. Thank you. Any other questions for Ray? Okay, great. If uh, if it's okay with people, then I think I might go ahead and drop off the call um, because I've got some other stuff to take care of. Would that be acceptable or do you guys need me to stick around? No, that's great, Ray. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, good luck. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, if we, uh, if uh, Kylie, if you're uh, available, uh, let's uh, get your uh, two cents on the, both the SBA program, but also if you make some comments generally about what you see your bank and banking in general acting like these days. Yes. Can everybody hear me? I, did I, can everybody hear me or no? Yeah. Kylie. Oh, good. That's a, ben that's a bonus. It's nice to have my younger sister at home with me to help me figure this out. Um, first of all, I want to say I am so just giving all my energies out to all the manufacturers out there right now. It, it, it is definitely a world that I don't think, even though my voice seems low, very high and young, it actually I've been in the industry since um, 98. Um, and I, I, as you have never seen anything like this. So I'm going to take my little piece in two, in two parts. Unfortunately, yesterday I was mostly talking to companies. And so Rick and I picked a slide to make sure you had something in front of you. Um, but my two parts I want to talk about is one, kind of where are you at right now? And kind of how does the bank think about where you're at right now? And two, what do you think you might want to take the next step even after you um, hang up this call, just to make sure you're side by side with all your financing arms in case that is an expense that, you know, drags that or cash flow piece that drags you down. So the first thing that we have talked about is really looking at how much cash do we have on hand. Um, and some people are saying three months, some people are saying six months. I've been talking to my, all my customers. Let's see if we have six months available of cash on hand. Um, so that's the exercise that they've been going through in, in, in a quick mode. Um, at the same time, they've been just handling where are my orders going, my sales. And, hey, you know, Kylie, maybe the first Kylie, day maybe, yeah, Kylie yeah. Ex excuse me. You, were, uh, you started off really great and you're starting to fade a little bit. So it might just be closeness to your computer or wherever you're talking. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the the next part is, you know, looking at your cash on hand, which everybody looks at carefully, but doing a, a six month outlook. And basically, I think we all kind of can feel out where our sales are going to be based on orders that are not placing or sales are not going through. These exercises are very important because this is exactly kind of how a bank will want to, they'll want to talk to you about. And then if you haven't, just like um, Ray was saying with the SBA, you need to have all the year end financials in, even if they're just internals and not perfect, and any year to date financials. And, and banks want to look what it looked like the year before. So um, that's kind of the information. I know it all seems like a lot, but if you can pull that together, and then at the same time, I will call your banker. Because right now, the discussions that are going on are what how does that look like the exercise that you've been going through and what help do you need? We know this isn't normal. We know this isn't the company. So do we need to look at principal payment relief? And what does that mean to you? Does that help you out? Do we need to increase line of credit to give you more liquidity? Or are you going to lose all your AR and it's going to go over 90 days and your borrowing base is not in balance? Do we need to remove your borrowing base? So there are things that we're looking at that you might be living through and kind of assessing. 
And we want you and all banks to, if they have not reached out to you yet or not, to call them and start putting solutions together today. Because we know that almost everybody, except if they're very unique, will have to have something to help them out. Um, specifically, if you're looking at the SBA loans, you can definitely go ahead and look at deferring um, principal payments, lowering your rates, and stuff like that. Um, and I suggest if you have a very strong banker that you know has great ties in the bank, then go to him alone. But if you don't, I suggest that you have him or her, sorry, and I bring in their boss too. But today is a day where a bank really needs to be with you and help you, and you don't want to wait until you're in a, a stretch where, you know, things might be just too far. So I guess that's why Rick wanted me on the phone today. I can open up for any questions. Kylie, you, you highlighted most of what you think people need to do, but it, what's, the, uh, what's the top of the list of uh, things to avoid right now uh, for people in terms of how they're dealing with their bank? Um, I think what you shouldn't avoid is not calling your bank. Um, banks want you to call them, and they want you to tell them what you need from them, um, because none of this was anything to deal with the manufacturer themselves. It is because of an environment that none of us can control. So I think the, the worst thing you can do is just not call your bank right now. I think you call them and you, and you talk to them about what you're looking at, what you feel you're going to run into. And, and, you know, if you're a very good client and they're not respecting your voice, then you just go call another bank and, and get somebody to just help you out. Because it's one of those times you can't allow your business to not succeed because you're all successful. Okay. Thank you, Kylie. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. Okay. If there are no other, que no other questions, uh, Zachary. All right. Thanks, Rick. And uh, thanks for having me on today's call. Uh, I'm Zach Youssef. I'm a senior manager in our national tax office um, <clears throat> out of the Cleveland office. And um, you know, again, I think this is so great of all of us getting together here and uh, getting out information. And so today I'm going to talk about kind of two different current tax relief items that, that are out there for COVID-19. And uh, um, I'll maybe take a break in between the two um, to open up for questions. Um, so the first one being an income tax payment deferral. Perfect. And Thank so you. So the IRS officially uh, issued no, a notice, notice 2020-17, just yesterday, and this income tax deferral allows for a 90-day deferral of any income tax payments that would be due here on April 15th. So that would be any taxes uh, related to your 2019 calendar year, as well as any 2020 first quarter tax estimates that would be due. And again, that is, is just a deferral of up to 90 days. The, the amount of the deferral is up to uh, an aggregate amount of $1 million for individuals and $10 million um, for corporations. And so um, the upside here is it, uh, it does alleviate potential current cash flow um, considerations. Um, however, it, it's not at all getting rid of the liability. And, um, you know, it's essentially still going to be owed here in 90 days. So as you kind of think of deferring that, um, you know, again, you kind of have to reassess here um, where you're at in 90 days. And the other thing I'll add is uh, as far as your actual tax return filings, um, those are not deferred. So, um, you know, we, we're recommending uh, to file an extension if you are not going to timely file um, as, as a kind of precaution um, at the very least. So I'll maybe stop there and, and see if we have any questions or comments related to um, this income tax payment deferral. Do you know if if Ohio is going to follow suit in that as well? 
Yeah, so as, as everything here uh, evolving very quickly, um, we do anticipate a lot of states, um, including Ohio, Ohio, to follow suit. And again, with this kind of notice just officially being into place um, here yesterday, um, we were, we're actively monitoring that. And again, no, no official word, um, but we, we do think at the state level there is a, a good possibility that they'll follow suit. Thank you. All right, so the, the second um, tax relief component. Um, that Zachary? Yes. Uh, we had a question here from uh, Robert Priest. Uh, are you in the chat? Can you see it? There we are. Does yeah, so so uh, Robert's question there was, does the payment deferral apply to our individual employees? Um, and so, Robert, if you're referring to, you know, your individuals and your employees individual 1040 tax return, um, then yes, this deferral uh, applies you know, again across the board to all U.S. taxpayers. And that limit is uh, $1 million for individuals um, and $10 million for corporations. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll bring up here um, the, the next kind of component, and um, th there's still a lot developing related to this, um, but um, it's kind of being referred to as the payroll tax credit. And so this was part of a bill um, that was uh, passed through Congress uh, just yesterday and uh, was signed by the president um, early or late last night. And so th this is part of the bill known as the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And it mandates new paid leave requirements um, to be implemented upon additional guidance from the Department of Labor. Labor. And um, so we're, we're at the point where, again, it was just signed here last night by the president. And um, we're waiting for that additional guidance um, for it to be fully uh, mandated um, and that guidance is to come no later than 15 days um, after the date it was signed. So um, we think it's very likely uh, this will be before April 1st, um, but uh, we're, we're waiting and seeing a, on that on that additional guidance from the Department of Labor. So this is uh, a bill designed to help compensate employee employers um, and the self-employed for paid leave, uh, and it's in the form of a payroll tax credit. And it is to be mandated uh, for all um, private employers uh, with fewer than 500 employees, um, but potentially uh, more than 50. Uh, and this would be uh, uh, to provide paid leave requirements for up to 12 weeks um for their employees and um the uh the first two weeks of that paid leave uh are imposed under a new section um brought by the bill called the emergency paid sick leave act and so this would be um for again for up to, to two weeks or 10 working days and it is a uh it, it it's capped at up to $511 per day per employee. Um, and that would again apply here for, um, th apologies for the hesitation, a lot of this is still again uncertain and, and where we need answers still. Um, so that kind of limit and what it applies for um, is is left pretty broadly within the bill, and we're waiting for clarification through the regulations. Um, but essentially, for family members who have had a sort of corona corona related illness or need to seek care isolation um, related to the virus, uh, this credit would apply. 
so for after those first two weeks, um, what we then have uh, the remainder of the 12 week period, so the, the subsequent 10 weeks would fall under a short term expansion of the Family and Medical Leave Act. And this would be um, again for, for the same type of required sick leave um, t t for employees, and it would be at $200 uh, per day per employee uh, for uh, an aggregate total of uh, $10,000. So these the, the, the credit that so after being mandated at the employee level, the, the credit that the employer receives is 100% refundable tax credit in the form of a payroll tax credit um, and can be qualified for or applied for on their quarterly payroll tax returns. And again, we're, we're at a kind of point where um, we're waiting for additional guidance and hopefully we'll answer more questions related to these items. But if big picture, again, this was, um, you know, help to to design and alleviate, you know, both from the employee level that um, they're they're going to get in the form of paid leave if, the, if, if they work for smaller um, employers, and then to to alleviate that um, at the employee level or employer level, uh, this 100% payroll tax credit. So uh, again, as I mentioned here, um, all this is kind of still developing, waiting for final regulations and. Uh, I did want to, um, you know, if not already shared, um, certainly get out that, you know, our national tax office is, is monitoring this closely and uh, is looking to issue um, additional guidance, um, you know, through our COVID-19 um, uh, resource center um, that I would highly recommend that, that all um, follow. So uh, I'll, I'll close with saying, um, you know, again, it's, uh, we have a, lots of different moving pieces. We're also anticipating um, another piece of legislation uh, that should be coming next week. And again, th there's no guarantees, uh, but um, we, we think it's you know very plausible that there'll be additional um, tax relief as part of this uh, second round of legislation that comes out. So with that, I'll open up uh, for questions. Yes, if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, to chat, uh, put those in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask the question, no problem. You mentioned that this seems to apply to companies with employees of 50 to 500 employees what about smaller companies like with 20 employees yeah so that is um an area that we certainly you know it's well known that needs further clarification and we think we'll get um however you know the the current interpretation is that the the, man, the mandate for this paid leave um is exempt for employers with fewer than 50 employees Zach, it looks like there's a question in the chat box uh, regarding is the next week legislation the direct payments has been discussed. Yeah, so I, I presume uh, the direct payments for into is um, this kind of thousand um, dollars that, that we hear in, in the news and it, it would be thought of as, as part of that next piece of legislation. Um, you know, again, those direct payments might not necessarily fall under kind of tax relief, um, but we would imagine all that would be part of um, the same piece of legislation. Okay. Zachary, what kind of proof does there have to be? Um, someone has to present to show that the employee is a. I, I, I assume this isn't mm -hmm. something that someone does subjectively. There has to be some sort of proof that they have to be out of work. Yeah, so that that's a great question um, and a, currently an open question. Um, and, you know, again, is that should an employer uh, and an employee have to obtain written documentation from a healthcare provider 
um, or will it be kind of on a, a self-imposed quarantine? Um, that is currently an open question um, that we do think will get clarified through these regulations that will be released um, within the next 15 days. It, if I was to, to say my personal inclination, I, I would imagine um, you know, due to the uh, pressure um, on the healthcare system currently, um, I, 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 it'd, be, it'd be hard for me to imagine uh, a required documentation from a healthcare provider, um, but uh, we will certainly see here in the next 15 days. And Zach, there's a question asking, what about earned vacation and how it affects the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act? So uh, I'm not entirely clear. Let me clarify a little bit on the earned vacation. So um, is that kind of just your general kind of uh, paid time off or PTO plan that a employer would have? Yes. Yeah, so again, the, the, the goal of, of, of this payroll tax credit is that again for this 12 week period um, uh, that a employer that, that meets these requirements um, over 500 employees or excuse me of fewer than 500 employees um, are required to pay you out of this emergency paid sick leave act so um, kind of putting it in, in general terms um, you know the first 12 weeks would again be paid out of this new new plan and we would not be required to kind of utilize any of that PTO that you built up. Got it. Any other questions for Zach? Zach, just you know, in terms of what you're hearing and feeling, if if you have fewer than 50 employees, you know, what, what do you think? I mean, if you're an employer with fewer than 50 employees, what do you think is going to happen here? I, I do think that if you have fewer than 50 employees, you're going to be uh, eligible to exempt out of this. Um, it's it's hard to tell. Uh, you know, again, the, fir the first question is, how do you uh, measure employees? And there's no definitive guidance on that. You know, again, you could have a number of um, hourly employees that don't maybe work full time so on and so forth. So um, ho hopefully, again, we're optimistic that that will be uh, for the clarification through these regs that are coming out. Um, but kind of just generally, I think if you're below that 50 employee threshold, um, you, you will not be mandated um, to be part of this emergency sick leave act. And what's the what's the advantage of opting out? If you, can you then re let can you then fire employees and you can't fire them if you're opted in or what's the difference? Well, so um, as far as the firing and not firing, uh, yeah, that, that's probably more uh, out of my realm and probably more of a legality um, and uh, labor relations type of issue. Um, but uh, I get, you know, if the, the, the benefit of opting out is that you, you know you're not required to make these payments. Um, as I mentioned there, the the Family Medical Leave Act expansion is capped at uh, ten thousand um, dollars in in refundable credits. So you could end up in a scenario where um, you're you're paying out more and not recouping that a hundred percent through a refundable credit. Got it. Okay, any other questions from anyone? All right, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us on the call today. I do want to mention that at the, uh, at the top of our Manufacturing Works webpage, uh, there is a new section in there. Uh, it's right on the top right-hand corner of the page and it's entitled Resources. And if you click on that resources uh, button, 
it uh, will bring up some COVID-19 resources that we are compiling. It's a it's an ongoing list that we'll be adding to, uh, but it's just kind of a little go to resource for you to uh, just to kind of keep on top of uh, things that we are finding out that we feel would be important to our manufacturing members to know. Uh, but we uh, we want to thank you all for joining us on the call today and, and thanks to the presenters for sharing such valuable information and insight during these trying times. Uh, we do encourage you all to please share with us your thoughts on topics that you'd like to see covered in future calls and we will do our best to address these for you. Um, please stay tuned to your email as we announce our next call and if there's any other manufacturers in your network that you think would benefit from this information feel free to share it with them or let us know and we'd be happy to reach out to them. Uh, but again, thank you, stay safe, and we look forward to speaking with everyone soon. Thank you. Yeah, and also let me say that we're, we're around, uh, so we're working, most of us remotely, but we're available. Um, so if you need help, uh, call, we're here to help. Thank you. Well done.